You're listening to the Greek's Gridiron. Now here's your host, Ethan Aristadoulou. Hello again, everybody, and a happy Wednesday. As today, a day early, we are doing picks for week 12 of the NFL with Thanksgiving hosting three games starting as early as 1230 in the afternoon tomorrow. I decided to go ahead, get a jump on the games, make my picks today. That way you guys have all day today and even in the early portion of tomorrow to digest and get a good look as to what I'm thinking for the games this week. So make sure you comment down below. Make sure you share your picks with me. Let me hear your thoughts on my picks. I'm currently sitting at 101 in 63 right now record wise you went a, a, a solid nine and five last week was hoping for a little bit better but i'll take nine and five in a good positive direction as we dive into the thursday matchups starting with green bay taking on the detroit lions this time in detroit the last time these two teams played the lions pretty much manhandled the green bay packers and now with the lions being four and one at home and this game being in detroit and we've kind of seen now what green bay is a very young offense that is somewhat mistake prone and going through their growing pains and a defense that can be pretty stout at times I'm really not too sure how I feel about this matchup in terms of Green Bay coming out victorious, especially when you look at injuries. Luke Musgraves on that injury report. Jair Alexander has been on it for weeks now. You have Reed, Campbell, Jones, Jenkins, Clark, AJ Dillon. I mean, there's just so many guys on the list. This Green Bay Packers team has not been healthy all season long, and Detroit, for the most part, comes in relatively healthy. Uh, IR people aside, the only guy really listed on their injury report of super significance, Jonah Jackson. Not injury report, Excuse me, uh, as far as like a questionable Jonah Jackson, I guess it is the injury report. Detroit, though, coming into this game, I mean, they're averaging seven points a game more per again uh, compared to the Green Bay Packers. And I mean, defensively, as far as points per game goes, they're roughly about the same. Packers are averaging about 20 points a game allowed to the Detroit's 23. So like a field goal more. So not a massive difference there, despite Green Bay being 10th and Detroit 22nd. You're only talking about a three point difference there roughly. But I mean, offensively, I just don't really know how Green Bay is going to be able to keep pace with the Lions, especially if things get going early for them. When you do look at kind of how this matchup works, uh, both these teams' defenses kind of succeed in different ways. Green Bay, obviously, with a very stout passing defense despite their struggles. They're averaging only about 193 yards a game through the air allowed, which is a solid number, seventh in the NFL. So they do have a tall task against Detroit. They're averaging over 263 yards a game. And then for Detroit, it's all about their run defense and how they're able to basically just make teams one-dimensional. And it turns into a can-you-pass-better-than-we-can type of thing if you can slow down their run game on top of that but I mean Detroit's just a very potent offense they've been very good all season long finding ways to win last week was a bit of a scary one but they battled back took advantage of a defensive collapse over there in Chicago and got the win and like I mentioned Detroit they're four and one at home Green Bay can't really buy a win on the road sitting at one and four Sorry for the cut there. I just sneezed there. But Detroit, 4-1 and one at home as Green Bay is 1-4 and four on the road here. I just have a really hard time buying into a Green Bay win. So I am going to take the Lions, and I think we're going to see another handed victory here. 31-20, to 20, another good game from Detroit as Green Bay continues to kind of just struggle through their growing pains of a very young and inexperienced offense all around. Next game we're looking at is the Washington Commanders taking on the Dallas Cowboys as the Cowboys currently sitting at 4-0 and at home and 7-3 on the season take on a Commanders team that feels as though we're starting to see kind of the beginning of the end for their season with their devastating and pretty crushing loss to the New York Giants last week. Dallas simply just kind of outmatches Washington in all the categories that you would want to look at here. Points per game scored, allowed, the turnover margin, I mean it, that passing yards per game, whether it's passing for or against same with rushing. I mean, there's really not anything that the commanders are better than the Cowboys at. And if there's one thing that I'm sure of, there is a really good chance that we see a sack party in this game from the Dallas Cowboys. So best of luck to the commanders, but I really don't have too much to dive into on this game here. It's one of those trap games, I guess you could say for the Dallas Cowboys. And I, I did talk about this in my power rankings. I thought the Cowboys maybe let the Panthers hang around just a little too well for the majority of that game, ultimately pulling away in the fourth quarter against the Panthers. But I think that this is one of those games here where Dallas is going to want to come in national spotlight Thanksgiving against a division rival. They're going to want to get put a shellacking on them. And I think we do see something along that line. I have the Cowboys winning 32 to 17 pretty handed victory for them. 
And then looking at the third and final game, this one at 8.20 at night with NBC for the final game of Thursday's three-game slate on Thanksgiving. Love that we get three games on Thanksgiving. A, a football fan in me is all about it. We have the San Francisco 49ers being hosted by the Seattle Seahawks here. Unfortunately, 49ers reported earlier this week that they are putting Talanoa Hafunga on the IR, so devastating loss for the secondary there. Also, some questionables, I think, that are worth mentioning on their end. Javon Hargrave, Ray, Ray McLeod, are on there, Aaron Banks as well. But Seattle also has a strong list of questionables and honestly a group of guys that really makes it a hard pick for me to take Seattle in this one despite being at home. You have DK Metcalf hurt right now. Geno Smith also dealing with that elbow shoulder thing that he has going on. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I know it was something with his throwing arm. Kenneth Walker also leaving the game early last week as well. Tariq Woolen's on that list, and Jarek Reed just got put on the IR. You're looking at a lot of significant injuries, especially on the offensive side of the ball there. If you don't have Geno Smith and you're relying on Drew Locke to be your guy, I don't quite know if Seattle's going to have it in the tank to be able to pull off the upset victory here. And I mean, if Seattle gets rolling, I just don't know if offensively they can keep up. I mean, the 49ers are averaging nearly 28 points per game right now to the 21 and a half or so that the Seattle Seahawks are averaging. And if they don't have Geno Smith under center, that is a bit of a problem. Not to mention that San Francisco, they score on about 45.5% of their offensive drives, which is good for third best in the NFL, whereas Seattle's more just like middle of the pack at 37.8%. So I'm going to take the San Francisco 49ers. If you didn't already uh, decipher where I was heading in on that one there, I just feel like they're a very clean pick. I have them winning 27 to 19 here and for what it's worth, I feel like the favorites are pretty favorable in the Thanksgiving slate this weekend. We're probably good for a single upset, and I'll get one of these games wrong here, but just looking at all three of those games, I have a hard time picking against any and coming up with like a good solid reasoning as to why that game winds up being an upset. The next game that we're looking at here, we have ourselves the Miami Dolphins taking on the New York Jets in a game where we have two teams in just complete different places right now. You look at Miami, they have the best points per game average of the season right now, sitting at about 30 and a half points per game. And you're going up against the Jets, who on the season are averaging 15 points a game. But when you really dive into it, the last four games, they've averaged a measly nine points. The Jets are just kind of falling apart at the seams offensively. Tim Boyle is going to be the starting quarterback in this game against Miami. And there is just a good possibility that Miami just runs wild all over on this defense for as good as they have been against the pass in New York. They can't really stop a nosebleed on the ground. They're allowing about 137 yards per game. So even if Miami does struggle to throw the football here, you have a group of running backs that are pretty good, if I would say so. Uh, there is some concern, though, as far as injury concerns. Uh, Devon H. Han ended up leaving the game after making his comeback last week, so that is something to keep an eye on. Raheem Mostert's also listed as questionable as well. So there are some concerns as far as the running rack room goes, but I mean, even if you have one of the two in there, I'd feel very confident in what you can do. And I mean, on the defensive side for the New York Jets, to couple with the offensive injuries that they've been dealing with all season long, Quincy Williams, Jermaine Johnson, and John Franklin Myers are all listed as questionable right now. And even if you're missing like even one or a couple of those guys, that really hurts what you're doing up front on the defense so I don't really know how you pick the Jets in this game here if I'm being completely honest with you I mean if you're going off based off just the injury reports alone and trying to maybe come up with a way for like the Jets to win maybe there's something along those lines because there are a lot of people on the Miami Dolphins aside from H and Mostert you also have Hill and Armstead Alec Ingold's on there who's important as their fullback Austin Jackson's on there so like there are some names but ultimately these teams are just in two completely different places right now. And like I said, Miami, even if they can't throw the football, could probably find some serious success on the ground. They have the second best rushing attack in the NFL going up against the 30th ranked rushing defense in the NFL. I like the Dolphins and give me Miami 23 to 10 for a good win over their division rivals. Now we start moving into Sunday, looking at the early window of games here and in a game where I really wish I just did not have to make a pick here because even in my notes, the first thing I jotted down was how do you even pick this game here? You have the New Orleans Saints being hosted by the Atlanta Falcons as both teams come in now 
The Saints have lost Michael Thomas for the season. He is now on the IR. Derek Carr is questionable for the Saints as well, and Taylor Heineke on the Falcons side. So both starting quarterbacks at this moment are listed as questionable. And we look at some of the other guys, as far as New Orleans goes, Marshawn Lattimore is also somebody that's listed. And then for the Atlanta Falcons side, David Onyemata, Mac Hollins. So both teams dealing with it a little bit here, but the Michael Thomas blow is a is a serious one because I think it's one that really makes this game a lot muddier and a lot harder to decide because it's just thinning the wide receiver corpse over there in New Orleans in what has already been a pretty suspect and tough offense to watch all season long despite the immense amount of talent they have over there the one thing though that really sticks out to me though is just how evenly matched both of these defenses are when you look at the numbers here as far as passing yards per game goes 199 yards per game allowed by New Orleans, 200 yards allowed by Atlanta. As far as rushing yards per game allowed goes, you're looking at 113 yards per from New Orleans and 108 yards per from the Atlanta Falcons. And even with scoring here, New Orleans averaging about 20 points a game allowed. Atlanta's a little bit a, a little bit behind them at about 21.7, so almost 22. But I mean, for the most part, both defenses stack up fairly well against each other. Both offenses, as far as scoring goes, not too far apart either. New Orleans is around 21 points. Atlanta's around 19. But if there's no Derek Carr in New Orleans and you're trying to trust in Jameis Winston to not just say F it and throw the football up there because someone's got to be out there somewhere, ah, man. I just I, I, I don't really know who to go with. It's tough because I'm making picks so far in advance and we don't really know what the quarterback situation is going to look like here. If Derek Carr plays, I think it greatly increases the chance of the New Orleans Saints, but he's still in the concussion protocol and I'm kind of concerned that he might not be able to go. As for the Atlanta Falcons, if Taylor Heineke's not playing, I just don't really know if I can buy a Desmond Ritter led offense. But again, there's just so many unknowns and I don't really know what to go with. And part of me feels like I'm leaning on the side of the Falcons right now just for the fact that they do have somewhat of a home field advantage. They're three and two at home. They're a little bit more comfortable in ATL than they are on the road. So I think I'm going to lean Falcons on this game here. But this is a pick and I am not by any means confident in this selection. I'll take Falcons 20 to 16. But if Derek Carr ends up playing and whether Taylor Heineke plays or not, I think if Derek Carr is at least playing, I'd feel a little bit better about the Saints offense but even then it's not like the Saints offense has really lit the world on fire by any means both these teams kind of in a messy spot right now working for the lead in what is the probably worst division in football right now but I'll take the Falcons 20 to 16 ugly contest uh, and I'm not confident on this one next we have Pittsburgh taking on Cincinnati in man oh man Cincinnati fans, I'm sorry. Uh, when I saw that Joe Burrow was done for the season earlier last week, I was or late last week, I was pretty devastated because I am a big Joe Burrow guy. I love Joe Burrow and the game that he brings to the table, but uh, definitely a devastating loss for the team and one that kind of derails any hope, I would say, of a playoff push at this season because I don't quite know how Jake Browning will fare for you as your incumbent starter the remainder of the season. And when you look at what the Pittsburgh Steelers are doing, I'm sure emotionally, Emotions are going to be flying high, and there should be some excitement in the air. And I know you Steelers fans are excited because Matt Canada has officially been relieved of his duties as offensive coordinator over there in Pittsburgh. And you even heard it from Mike Tomlin himself. He just wants to see points. And I think there is a possibility we might see a little bit of an improvement on that. On top of that, with the matchup, just kind of looking at it at face value, the Steelers defense, I would say, despite the amount of yards they let up, gets really tight in the red zone. And on top of that, they just they do a really good job of keeping teams at least out of scoring position. They're allowing only 19 and a half points a game. And so I do think that with a quarterback in Jake Browning, who has not really seen a ton of starting experience so far in his career leading the way, I don't really know if you can buy Cincinnati to win this game, even if they are at home right now. Pittsburgh loves to force mistakes. They force turnovers on about 16.7% of a opponents offensive drives which puts them at second best in the NFL and my hope is that with the change at offensive coordinator in Pittsburgh we see some sort of improvement I'm hoping that maybe we see the Steelers attack the middle of the field a little bit more they lean more into a running game that has actually shown some life but for whatever reason we've seen a lack of commitment from with the offense over there so I'm banking on some progression in the Steelers offense with a new offensive coordinator and one that is their interim being a guy who was their run game guy or the running backs coordinator excuse me so I do think that we're going to see 
see some more leaning into the run with Pittsburgh. It's going to be more of a ground and pound type offense. I'm excited for that. And I think it's going to open things up for Kenny Pickett, who's had some ups and downs this season and a wide receiver room that has gotten a little bit boisterous as to like the state of the offense and what's going on over there. George Pickens, if you know what I'm talking about. But I am going to take the Steelers in a very Steelers-like victory, 19-9. to I expect them to give the Bengals some serious problems here. T. Higgins is still listed as questionable over there as well. So I, don't, I just I don't really know how you could buy Cincinnati in this matchup for an upset victory. It would be a serious blown loss if the Steelers don't come out with a victory on this one here. I think that this is a got to win and it should win type of matchup for them. So Steelers 19-9 to in a very Steelers-like score. Now we look at another one of those games where, again, I really wish I didn't have to pick between the two because you have to pick between basically two lessers of evils. We have the Carolina Panthers taking on the Tennessee Titans, but for what it's worth, if you're somebody who's just trying to maybe pick a money line, you know, what's the easy way to decide on this game? The Titans are 3-1 and one at home. They're only victories of the season coming at home in Tennessee, and you have Carolina who has yet to win a game on the road. So just on a broad look at the game, you do have that to kind of go by here. Not to mention the fact that Carolina is allowing the second most points per game right now this season at 27 and a half. So if you're someone that likes Tennessee, that's a little bit comforting for you. Maybe Will Levis and company could find some movement here as far as offense is concerned. But this really could be a good game for the Titans, I think, offensively overall, especially on the ground. If they get more back to the running game and just focus on pounding the rock and trying to make things easier for Will Levis, you're going up against a Panthers team that's allowing almost 130 yards per game on the ground. So this is a good kind of get right game for the rushing attack in Tennessee and on top of that even defensively despite some of the issues that we have seen from the Titans they do let teams move at times but they lock up in the red zone and they keep teams out of the end zone they're doing really really good at that so good that they are the second best red zone defense allowing only uh, touchdowns on what is it 37.8 percent of offensive drives with their opponents so there is that uh, there's the possibility that maybe Carolina's passing defense, though, does give Will Levis some issues for what it's worth. Uh, out of all the Carolina struggles that we've seen from them this year, they do have the sixth best passing defense in the NFL right now. I don't really know how that's possible, how that works out, but they do shut things down when it comes to throwing the football. So if for whatever reason Tennessee's struggling to throw the ball, they could always rely on a running back room that has Derrick Henry and a rookie running back in Tajay Spears that I think has shown some flashes here or there. But I do think that if Tennessee wants to come out victorious here, they've got to run the rock. And if Carolina wants to come out victorious, they've got to take advantage of a rookie quarterback, bring some pressure, make him uncomfortable and shut things down, maybe pull off a turnover or two pick interception. You know what I'm talking about. But as for who I think is going to win in this game here, I really think I'm leaning Tennessee, especially it being in Tennessee. Carolina, like I said, struggling on the road. I like the Titans. Lower scoring affair, 19-13. Definitely not a pretty game to watch. Now we look at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers taking on the Indianapolis Colts in what is kind of a tough matchup to pick, in my opinion, here. You have the Colts at 5-5, five and five, and you have the Buccaneers at 4-6. and six. And for what it's worth, I mean, yeah, Indianapolis might have been a better team offensively, but the Buccaneers have been a much better team defensively. And when you look at this game... Buccaneers, not necessarily the greatest on the road. They're two and three, but the Colts can't really seem to win at home, despite it's supposed to be a home field advantage type of thing. They're one and four at home. Most of their wins have come on the road. Oddly enough, all things considered with their season right now. The Colts are also coming off some emotion with the waving of linebacker Shaquille Leonard. I believe we're going to find out at some point today where he's going to be going once waivers are cleared up. I don't know if that's already been happening or not, or if that's or if that's happened, excuse me, or not at this point. But that is something to keep an eye on. Uh, I will say that there are some matchups that I'll be interested in looking at here. First one being if Jonathan Taylor and the Colts offensive line will be able to run successfully against Vita Vey and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers run defense. The Colts 10th in the NFL right now, averaging about 118 yards per game on the ground, have a tough one in a Tampa Bay Buccaneers team that's 6th in the NFL with only 90 rushing yards per game allowed. And then you have Tampa Bay a team that just cannot seem to run the football at all. They are the worst rushing team in the NFL right now, going up against the Colts defense that can't really stop the run themselves. So there are some you know interesting things to look at as far as this game is concerned. And 
I think really it just comes down to who winds up being the better team on third down. That's kind of like the simplest way I was able to put this game together because both teams, they convert on third down at about roughly 40%. The Colts are more closer to 39, whereas Buccaneers are sitting somewhere around like 40 or so. So I think whoever wins on third down and maybe finds some more success on the ground winds up being the team that comes out victorious here. And for me... I feel like I'm leaning just a little bit more towards Indianapolis just because of the fact that I believe in the offensive line there and how they're able to open up running lanes for Jonathan Taylor. Zach Moss has been a phenomenal compliment to Jonathan Taylor whenever he needs to step in for him since Jonathan Taylor has basically fully taken back over the reins as running back one in Indianapolis. So I think I like the Colts a little bit more in this one here. Tighter contest. Don't think it's too far apart between either one of these teams. I have Indy winning 21 to 17. Now we look at what has got to be one of the worst matchups of the season right now. We are looking at the New England Patriots being hosted by the New York Giants as the Giants are 1-3 at home, taking on the Patriots, who themselves are 1-3 on the road. Uh, so some questions to be answered here, and we'll find out, I'm assuming, in the next few days. Who's quarterback one for the New England Patriots? Is it going to be Bailey Zappi? Are they going to go with Mac Jones again? Does maybe Will Greer somehow step in and end up being quarterback one for this game here? I don't really know, and it doesn't really seem like anyone in the New England media seems to know as well. <clears throat> uh, for those of you that may not be aware, I live in the New England area, so I hear a lot of New England sports talk, and it seems very much up in the air as to who's going to be the quarterback for this matchup here. If there is one thing that I do know coming into this game, though, Bill Belichick loves to make life hell for rookie quarterbacks, and that is something to always keep in mind. He loves throwing all si sorts of just exotic type of things to really confuse a young man, and when you have Tommy DeVito start Starting over there in New York, that is obviously going to be a concern for the Giants. However, Tommy DeVito, for what it's worth, has looked somewhat solid the last couple of weeks for the Giants, and I think he's put together some better quarterbacking play than anyone that we've seen out of New England. Coupling that with the fact that the Giants can at least run the football effectively with Saquon Barkley, so there is that to keep in mind as well. So with that, Despite somehow the Patriots being minus three favorites on the road in this game here, I'm leaning Giants, and I have the Giants winning 20 to 10. I don't really know where people think the offensive production is going to come from with the Patriots, especially with quarterback one being up in the air right now. And if it's not Mac Jones, I have zero belief in Bailey Zappi or Will Greer really lighting the world on fire. There's some weird like hysteria in New England for like Bailey Zappi and how, you know, he had a good couple of games last year. And it, I just... I, we would have seen Bailey Zappi starting for the Patriots a lot sooner if the Patriots had that much confidence in him. And I, I somehow feel like that gets lost on Patriots fans, and I don't really understand why. Not sure how New England's minus three favorites and how people are betting that direction, but I am all for the Giants getting the victory in this matchup here. Like I said, 20 to 10, I'm not really sure where Patriots offensive production is going to come from because they have just been miserable on offense, where at least the Giants have found a little bit of success the last couple of weeks. Now, looking at what is probably one of the more exciting games of the weekend here, we have the Jacksonville Jaguars heading into Houston to take on their division rival Texans. If you all remember, the Texans pulled off a massive upset victory last, or not last week, excuse me, earlier in the season over this same Jacksonville Jaguars team. But now, looking, because hindsight is always 2020, looking back at it, that really wasn't much of an upset here considering just how good the Houston Texans have been this season. And this matchup has a lot riding on it. This is basically, this is for possession of the AFC South, a position that I did not expect the Texans to be in. I don't think a lot of people did by any means, but here they are, 10th best scoring offense in the NFL, and they're bringing it to the Jaguars. I'm very excited for this one. Not to mention, not only to mention that Houston they're 4 and 1 at home right now. Jaguars, they're 4 and 0 on the road. There are a lot of things making this game very very exciting to look at here. Both teams relatively healthy for the most part, Jacksonville especially, considering they just came off their bye week not too long ago. The Houston, uh, Houston Texans do have a couple of guys that are worth mentioning here. Jimmy Ward, Jack, uh, Jake Hansen, Noah Brown are some guys on there. Damian Pierce, who's been dealing with something for a while now the last few weeks. But these teams stack up just oddly well when you really look at the numbers here. As far as scoring goes, points per game by the offenses. Jacksonville, 23 points a game. Houston, just about 24. Points allowed per game, you're looking at about 20 and a half for Jacksonville, 20 and a half for Houston, roughly, give or take. Those are just estimates. It's not the exact number. Turnover or takeaway margin, differential, takeaway differential, whatever you want to call it, 
plus three for both of these teams here. Defensive passing yards per game allowed. The Jacksonville Jaguars are 29th. The Texans are 25th. When you look at run yards per game allowed, fourth for Jacksonville, eighth for Houston. I would say that you maybe give a tiny, tiny edge to the Jacksonville Jaguars defensively, but not much. And then on the flip side of things, offensively, I'd give the edge to the Houston Texans. C.J. Stroud has been an absolute menace and is again, and I cannot make this point enough, a true MVP candidate for this season. It has been unbelievable what C.J. Stroud has done for this Texans team, and that should not be lost on anyone simply because he's a rookie. He is as important to his team as any other player is to any other team. And if the Texans find themselves in the playoffs, he is absolutely one of those top three considerations for an MVP award this season. Absolutely. With Everything that I've just said here, as far as this game is concerned, uh, when I did rattle off those stats, both defenses, pretty stout against the run, pretty leaky against the pass. I think this game winds up being more of an aerial attack type of offensive game. I think we're going to see a lot of points. It should be a pretty exciting one. And I have the Texans winning. I think they're going to get the job done. I think they're going to steal the AFC South from the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I have them winning 31-27. to This one, in my opinion... Probably one of the best games of the weekend, if not arguably the best game of the weekend, just considering the stakes, the two opponents, and how well this matchup was received the first time around they played. So let's see some good football. Give me the Texans for a big W. Moving into the late windows of games now, Cleveland heading into Denver to take on a red-hot Broncos team that has wins over the the Bills, the Chiefs, and just took down the Vikings, who were on a bit of a Cinderella run themselves the last like month and a half. Who's going to come away victorious in this matchup here? I'm going to be honest, this one was a tough one for me to pick, uh, especially when you consider Cleveland's obviously coming into this game now. Deshaun Watson shut down for the season. You also have some other guys on the injury report that are worth mentioning here. Juan Thornhill, Anthony Walker, and you also lost Rodney McLeod as well. He went on the injury, uh, the IR as well. Now, when you look at these two teams here, and the way this game matches up, I really think it just comes down to who has the better defensive performance here. Through the last five weeks, Denver's only allowed about 17 points per game. Now, I know their numbers, when you look like season-wide, are super inflated because those first five weeks were abysmal for them. But following that, they've really turned it down, or turned it around, excuse me, defensively. And I think that they've become... One of the better defenses, honestly, that I would say that they're probably within the top 16 at the very least in the last like four or five weeks or so. Obviously, though, when you look at Cleveland, they're the best defense in the NFL right now, statistically speaking. When you look at all the numbers, they are tops. They shut down the run completely. They're averaging the lowest total yards per game right now in the NFL. And there is a way for Cleveland to win this game, even without Deshaun Watson. And the way I see it, Cleveland needs to be heavily considering just pounding the rock running the football. They have the third best rushing attack in the NFL right now, averaging about 142 yards per game on the ground. The Denver Broncos, all season long, for what it's worth, not been too great against the run. They are averaging about 160 yards per game, and I know that number is a bit inflated because of their matchup with the Dolphins earlier in the season. So, again, that number is probably a little bit higher than the true actual average if you take that one game out. But it is something that I think is a very good matchup and in favor of the Cleveland Browns. If Cleveland can do what they've done all season long, lock up the opposing offense, I know that the Broncos are one of the hotter teams in the NFL right now, but the Browns have been shown to be able to shut down teams and win defensively, whether it's through Miles Garrett or some big interception play from Denzel Ward, whoever it may be. I'm leaning Cleveland in this matchup here. I think it's going to be a low-scoring affair. I think we're going to see two really good defenses going at it right now, Denver being a hot defense at the moment. But I'm going to take the Browns 17-13. to I don't expect a lot of offense in this game here. I think we're going to see two defenses really decide the matchup here. Again, considering there's no Deshaun Watson in Cleveland. And Russell Wilson's been really good, but if you can get the pressure on him... You can, call, you can cause him to make mistakes or at least just force him into bad plays and making just, you know, low, not making those low percentage plays, I guess you could say. I do like Cleveland, though, in this matchup here. I'm going to ride Cleveland. I know Denver's hot, and I know some Broncos fans are wondering why I keep picking against them despite the fact that they keep winning here. Cleveland's another one of those teams that I just I don't really understand how they're winning either. So you're, you're basically just picking between two teams that somehow keep finding ways to win as of late. 
And I'm going to go with the Browns on that one. Next, we have the Los Angeles Rams being hosted by the Arizona Cardinals. And this is one that is a tough one to decide on, largely in part because the wide receiver room in L.A. is just in tatters right now. You're dealing with injuries to Puka Nakua, Cooper Cup, and Ben Skoranek. At this point, I don't really know who's going to be left to catch passes from Matthew Stafford in this game here, but the good news is for the Rams, Kyron Williams is expected to be back according to Sean McVay, so that is something to keep in mind here. For all the struggles that the Rams have dealt with this season, I think losing Kyron Williams was a big piece of that because he was lighting it up on the ground and helped make this offense a lot more balanced, and so he is going to be a welcomed returned addition. Now, as for the injuries to their wide receivers over there in LA, I think that if you have at least Puka Nakua or and or Cooper Cup in the game, you feel pretty good about it. So I think if you have at least one of those two guys, you're feeling okay, but you want that wide receiver room as health, healthy as possible, obviously. As for the Arizona Cardinals, despite getting Kyler Murray back, there is still some serious concern with this team altogether. They're 2-9 and nine for a reason, and it's not because they were just missing a quarterback all season long. There are a lot more issues, especially offensively, to look at here. A group that just feels very clunky and not quite in the same rhythm yet. And with that say, being said... I think I'm leaning more heavily towards the Rams than I are the Cardinals, especially with the Rams defense kind of being surprisingly a little bit better than I think a lot of people have been anticipating as of late. I know that they're only allowing about 22 points a game right now, and that puts them at 20th in the NFL, but 22 is not a super high number. There are just some teams with some incredibly low numbers totals this year per game. But defensively, especially against the pass, they've been able to shut things down. And, and I think one of the biggest things when it comes to being able to stop Kyler Murray. It's bring pressure, but also just make sure you can contain him. You can't let him get outside the pocket. And you saw the Texans do that really well last week. So if the Rams can kind of take a look at what the Houston Texans did, and you have a guy, obviously, in Aaron Donald, who can collapse a pocket from the inside, if you can just have him do what he does from the interior and let your guys on the edge just make sure they maintain, contain, or they maintain, contain, they at least contain Kyler Murray in the pocket, you should have a result ending in a Los Angeles Rams victory here. I have the Rams 20 to 13, uh, but I will say this for me deciding on that. The Cardinals do like to run the football and Kyler Murray can be a problem with his legs. They're the ninth best rushing attack in the NFL right now. And the Rams are 22nd in Rundy. So if for whatever reason, things are just not working as far as throwing the football, Kyler Murray is always a threat. If the Rams can't contain Kyler Murray inside the pocket, that's always an issue as well. And even if the Cardinals just find some, you know, middling success on the ground, it could be a little bit of an issue for the Rams. But I do think I'm going to lean LA for the victory on that. And now we look at an AFC West matchup as the Kansas City Chiefs take on the Las Vegas Raiders. The Raiders 4-1 at home with the Kansas City Chiefs 3-1 on the road. Casey's coming off of a really tough Monday night loss where, you know, they were a catch away for potentially stealing away a victory from the Philadelphia Eagles. And then the Las Vegas Raiders putting up a really good fight in their loss against the Miami Dolphins team that a lot of people are expecting to find themselves in the playoff come season's end here. I think the biggest thing when you look at this game between the two is just how opportunistic can the Raiders be if the Chiefs' struggles to catch the football continue to be an issue. Kansas City currently leads the NFL in drops with 23 total, and they're five ahead of the next team behind them. If the Raiders can take advantage of some of the just errant mistakes that we have seen from the wide receiver room in Kansas City and can put points on the board, especially on like those third downs that just like the gotta have it plays that you're not having in Kansas City. If the Raiders can take advantage, there is a shot to win this game here. Defensively, the Raiders have been pretty good all season long. They're allowing about 20 and a half points a game to the Kansas City Chiefs 16 and a half. So I will say there is some hope for the Raiders, especially being at home. They've been very good. That's where the majority of their wins from this five and six seasons to this point have come from. They're four and one. I will say, though, that when I sit down and I look at this game here and I consider just the dominance that we have seen from Patrick Mahomes against his division. And for me, I have a very hard time sitting there and picking Aiden O'Connell over Patrick Mahomes in a matchup like this. 
the defense has been really good in Kansas City all season long. And even for the strengths that we have seen from the Raiders, especially against the pass this year, I don't quite know if I can take the Raiders in this game against the Chiefs, especially coming off of a really tough loss. I, I feel like it's going to be a very motivated Kansas City team to bounce back and get back to winning. So I'm going to take the Chiefs on this one here. I don't think they run away with the game by any means, though. I expect another good fight from the Raiders as they continue to fight for Antonio Pierce, and I have the Chiefs winning 22-18. to Wonky score, but I think we're going to see some weirdness in this game happen. There's just a gut feeling that I have there. So Chiefs 22-18. to and then we have what is potentially another one of the best matchups of the weekend here. We're looking at the Buffalo Bills being hosted by the 9-1 Philadelphia Eagles. I will say, the first thing that sticks out to me in this matchup here, Eagles being 4-0 at home, one of the best home field advantages in the NFL right now, going into going up against Buffalo, who is only 1-3 on the road. A large majority of their losses, more than half, being on the road here. Uh, Dallas Goddard, if I was reading that injury report correctly, is apparently already listed as out. Now, I don't know if that was a mistake, but I did see that on the injury report. So that is very noticeable or notable, excuse me, in my opinion. You also have Derek Barnett listed for the Eagles in this game here. But Buffalo, the secondary specifically, we're looking at Micah Hyde, Dane Jackson, Taylor Rapp, and Teron Johnson all dealing with stuff and all currently listed as questionable. If there is one thing that concerns me in Buffalo, it's going to be one, protecting the football, but two, also being able to bring enough pressure to help mitigate what might be a thin secondary going into this matchup here. Now, both these teams are fairly prone to turnovers. Like the Eagles, they're, by no means are they not <clears throat> turning the ball over themselves. They're actually 20th in the NFL right now, turning over on 13.3% of drives, but the Bills one of the biggest offenders in the NFL at 16.4%. They're 30th. So there is the turnover concern for the Bills, but it's not like the Eagles don't make a mistake here and there. And they've even said that themselves. Sometimes they, you know, they're, they're like willing their way to victory in some games, trying to find ways to win because they do make mistakes that hurt them. On top of that, I think that whoever is able to disrupt what the offense is, their opposing offense is doing, especially in the passing game, I think can wind up being victorious in this matchup here. For what it's worth, Buffalo is among the best in bringing pressure right now. As far as that goes, 27.1% of dropbacks. When you look at Philadelphia, they sit about middle of the pack at 23.1%. The Bills' biggest issue right now is the pressure being brought to Josh Allen and him being kind of forced into making mistakes. If Philadelphia can match what Buffalo is probably going to bring because they have brought every single game this season, albeit they are going up against a really good Eagles offensive line. I do think that there is a shot for Buffalo to maybe pull out a big victory in this game here. But if Philadelphia is able to take advantage of Buffalo and force them to be one dimensional, they are the best run defense in the NFL and Buffalo is not necessarily known for their success running the football, even though that they have been looking somewhat good the last few weeks, I would say their average in rushing yards per game has kind of trended in the right direction and a lot better of a direction than we, uh, I think they've been in the last few years, I would say. Uh, if Philadelphia can bring that pressure and shut down the run and force the Bills to be one dimensional, I think that winds up being a serious issue for Buffalo because when they get one dimensional and the weight of the world is on Josh Allen's shoulders, then you start seeing some of the mistakes and defense is kind of keying in on what they're doing here. And uh, it, you don't want to put Philadelphia in a position where you they know you can't run the football. So they're just going to let their defensive line pin their ears back and fly. So I think that's kind of where things, you know, they are get decided in this game here. Who brings the most most pressure? Who winds up being one dimensional more so the Bills than anything else? Because at least the Eagles have shown all season long they can run to victories and they can pass to victories. But if you can force Buffalo into a one dimensional situation, it gets a little bit ugly there. You start seeing those turnovers. Who protects the football more? And for me personally, in Philadelphia, I've got to go with the Eagles. 26 to 23. I think we're going to see a good game. I do think that Buffalo will have a a solid effort offensively, especially now that Joe Brady is leading the way. I think we got probably the best looking version of this Buffalo Bills offense that we've seen in quite some time, at least this season to this point. I know they've had some good victories, but that was a very solid effort where even though you were only settling for field goals early, that second half came and you really came to life. I like Buffalo, uh, not Buffalo, excuse me. I like Philadelphia in this game though in large part just because Philadelphia every single week 
just continues to find ways to win. And whenever I pick against Philadelphia, I wind up eating my words. So I don't think I want to pick against Philly this week, especially against a turnover prone team like Buffalo. I'll take the Eagles 26 to 23. And then looking at Sunday night football, last game of the weekend before we talk about Monday, Baltimore taking on the Chargers in LA. Now, I've already said this a lot, and I feel like I can't really stress it enough. Chargers got to fire Brandon Staley. And this game, if all goes the way I would like to see it happen, the Ravens win dominantly, and Brandon Staley gets fired at the end of it because it's an embarrassing loss. However, I don't quite know if that's actually going to be the case, but that's kind of what I'm hoping for here. There are some injury concerns with the Ravens that might prevent that. Ronnie Staley's on the injury report right now. You also have Marlon Humphrey and Odell Beckham. So key pieces to both your defense and your offense here. But the Chargers themselves, no, by no means any healthier. Joey Bosa, he's on the IR, done for the season. Devastating loss for a defense that was really relying on their pass rush all season long. Gerald Everett's listed as questionable. Jalen Guyton over the top burner. Isaiah Spiller's on there. Tanner Muse got put on the IR as well. So they have some guys dealing with some issues as well. But I will say that I think Baltimore's injuries are a little bit more significant and concerning at the moment, Joey Bosa aside, than I would say for the Chargers. Both these offenses can move. They can score. But realistically, the defense of the Baltimore Ravens is the deciding factor in this game here. When you look at Baltimore, third best red zone defense, allowing teams to score touchdowns on only 29.4% of trips into the red zone. They have the third best defense as far as scoring percentage goes, allowing teams to only score on 37.9% of drives. Second in points per game allowed, which is sitting at just a measly 16 points a game. And then they're also fourth in sacking percentage, bringing down the quarterback on 9.9% of dropbacks. I don't think... Minus Joey Bosa, the Chargers have a chance defensively against the Ravens. And I can see the Ravens defense giving a lot of fits to the LA Chargers offense going into this matchup. So I'm going to take the Ravens. I think they win 27 to 20. In an ideal world, the Ravens blow out the Chargers and I would be here for it. And we hear about Brandon Staley being fired that Monday morning. But we'll see if that happens. And then finally, to wrap things up, Monday Night Football. We have the Chicago Bears coming fresh off of a defensive collapse, going up against the Minnesota Vikings, currently working their way through the second half of their season story with Josh Dobbs under center. Now, as far as injuries go, I think it is worth mentioning that Kevin O'Connell did state that Justin Jefferson is considered questionable for this game here. So there is a potential that we do see Justin Jefferson, but it's not necessarily the most likely thing in the world right now. I will also note that Justin Jefferson made it very clear he does not care about your fantasy team. So don't expect him to be back and be counting on him just because you want him there for fantasy. Uh, And I highly respect that opinion. Now, There are two things I'm looking at in this game here that I think are very important pieces to keep in mind when you're looking at this matchup here. And the first one's going to be how Chicago's running game fares against Minnesota's run defense. They love to run the football in Chicago. They're the fourth best rushing attack in the NFL as far as yards per game goes with nearly 140. But the Minnesota Vikings only allowing about 94 yards per game on the ground. So I will be very interested in seeing how that matchup goes. The second thing I'll be looking at here is how Chicago's pass defense does against Josh Dobbs. We've seen Josh Dobbs be successful throwing the football and also hurting teams with his legs with that success throwing the football. In Chicago, they're a team prone to letting pretty much everyone move the football through the air, allowing about 245 yards a game. They're the 26th ranked passing defense as far as yards per is considered or concerned. So two things, Chicago's run game against the run D of Minnesota and Chicago's passing defense against Josh Dobbs and company over there in Minnesota, especially if Justin Jefferson finds himself in the fold as well. I do think that this game winds up being a little bit of a higher scoring affair. I don't know how high it could go, but there is definitely some potential for it. And I think the biggest reason for that is because of both these teams on third downs defensively, they're not necessarily great. When you look at Chicago, they allow third down conversions on 47.6% of attempts, which is the league's worst. And Minnesota also allows teams to convert on about 41.1% of third downs, which is 25th in the NFL. So there is a good opportunity that we at the very least see these teams move the football a lot, just a matter of if they're getting into the end zone or not. But I do think we could see some points 
That being said, as for who I think comes out victorious in winning this football game, I'm going to go Minnesota Vikings 24 to 20. But those are my picks for week number 12 of the NFL. As always, I invite you to comment down below. Let me hear your picks. Let me hear your thoughts on my picks. But that is it for me. I greatly appreciate it if you made it to the end of the video. I will see you all next time. Have a good one.